Ah, uh, the meet cute. That moment when two people are brought together by some quirky chance situation. Maybe they reach down to pick up the same shiny penny and bonk heads. Or they're not looking where they're going as they both come around the corner and spill their drinks on each other. The music swells, there's lots of lingering eye contact. Oh, it's like they were meant to be together. In real life though, sappy music doesn't usually play when we run into someone. And it's a lot less clear when we've met the love of our life or a forever friend. Instead, we warm up to each other over time. We probably don't even realize someone will be the most important person in our lives until they already are. And as meaningful as it is to find your soul friend while covered in coffee, building a relationship is rarely smooth sailing. In fact, it's entirely natural for relationships to end. People in the meet cutes or not so cutes we experience throughout our lives might seem unique, but it turns out our relationships follow patterns. Researchers have documented the stages we go through in relationships, and recognizing these stages helps us understand and communicate about our own relationships better. Because pretty much only in fiction do we jump from total strangers to soulmates for life. I'm Cassandra Ryder, and this is Study Hall, Intro to Human Communication. Relationships. We all have them, and they each start in their own special way. But the different ways relationships start and develop do have things in common. Like we don't read the super secret diary of someone we just met and quote details back to them, right? The communication researcher Mark Knapp identified fairly predictable stages that happen as we grow closer to and drift apart from people throughout life. Together, these stages make up Knapp's relational development model. And regardless of whether it's a professional connection, like with a mentor at work, a platonic friendship, a romantic connection, or something else, all relationships go through some, if not all, of these stages. First, let's talk about the stages involved in how a relationship comes together, or forms. The initiating stage is when we first connect or communicate with someone. Maybe it's a meet cute, a routine workplace interaction, exchanging casual glances on public transit. The list goes on. Whatever form it takes, in this stage, we're making an impression on another person, and they're making an impression on us. Robbie and Jen are in second grade when they have their friendship meet cute. During a field trip, they happen to sit next to each other on the school bus. Robbie notices the lift pass stuck in the zipper of Jen's coat, so he asks her if she knows how to ski or snowboard. Jen says she's learning to snowboard, and Robbie tells her that he likes to watch the Winter Olympics events with his family. After they get off the bus, though, neither of them think much about this interaction. It's not until a couple years later, when they're in fourth grade, that Robbie and Jen have more than just a casual interaction at school. This is when they enter the experimenting stage, which is when both people self-disclose to learn about each other. Robbie sees Jen on the monkey bars and gets a little competitive. Bet you can't beat my best time, he says. But when he times her, she beats his best time by a good five seconds. And they end up talking about the playgrounds in their neighborhoods and about the monkey bars they've mastered there. From there, Robbie and Jen move into the intensifying stage. Many of us have seen this stage portrayed in movies as a heartwarming montage of all the activities that build a relationship as the characters spend more time together. For Robbie and Jen, these activities are talking before class starts, sitting together at lunch sometimes, and hanging out in the back of the auditorium where they whisper jokes to each other during school <laughs> events. From the outside, the difference between experimenting and intensifying may be subtle, but in the intensifying phase, they've figured out what interactions they enjoy and both people are increasing contact. They may even start defining what the relationship is, like officially calling someone a friend or girlfriend or codependent platonic life partner, depending on the nature of the relationship. Now, people define what their relationship means at different times depending on the situation and context, but we really can't move forward to integrating the fourth stage without naming the connection we share. Because the integrating stage is where we're developing a relational identity, which is the way you present your connection to both yourselves and the world. There's me, there's you, and there's the thing between us that we can give a name to. Like once they get to the eighth grade, everyone can see Robbie and Jen are always talking in the hallways between classes. Their friends tease them about being in love, but since they created a relational identity in the integrating stage, they both can solidly say, stop it, that's my best friend in the whole world. Creating a public identity can also be a big part of the integrating stage. While we can of course integrate and develop a relationship identity in secret, a la Romeo and Juliet, if we're honest, we're probably still experimenting or intensifying if no one outside of the relationship knows about it. 
In practice, best friendships and even some romantic relationships may go through the integrating stage without a formal conversation about what the label is. Sometimes both people in a relationship do things like spend more and more time together, leave belongings at each other's homes, or spend time freely with each other's friend groups. These may be the signs that integrating is happening. The final coming together stage of a relationship is bonding, which is when a public declaration of commitment is made. This stage mostly applies to romantic relationships in a lot of cultures, since we don't go to the courthouse and sign a best friendship license. Most formalized relationships include something like a commitment ceremony, a marriage, or a financial transaction like buying a home together that shows we intend the connection we built to be permanent. Some folks even get matching tattoos. While friends and family may meet this person earlier on, the bonding stage is also where a lot of the connections between your people and their people are cemented. Like even though Robbie and Jen won't put on fancy clothes and throw themselves an official friendship party, the fact that Jen invites Robbie's parents to see her play the lead in the high school musical is an example of how his people are now her people. So many relationships will go through these stages of initiating, experimenting, intensifying, integrating, and bonding though everyone will spend different amounts of time in each stage and may bounce between some of the stages. Though we're not saying that once we've made it to the bonding stage, we've reached a relationship paradise. Realistically, we don't just bond with everyone we ever get close to and stay that way. It's natural to build relationships and it's natural for those connections to weaken or even break. So there are also stages for how a relationship comes apart. And according to Knapp's model, the first stage of coming apart is called differentiating. This is when some pressure or difference leads people in a relationship to become more individualistic. Now, getting to the differentiating stage doesn't always result in the end of a relationship. There can be very healthy differentiating. Partners may choose to do things separately and pursue their different interests, but they stay together harmoniously, accepting that they don't have to have everything in common. Take Robbie and Jen. In early adulthood, Robbie takes up water skiing and Jen becomes a competitive video gamer. They still like each other, but their passions keep them apart more than before. But if differentiation is more than just pursuing different preferences, then there can be issues. When one person's choices seriously impact the other person's choices, frustrations and arguments can occur. Ultimately, the differences themselves aren't necessarily the issue, but rather the feeling that our differences are too large for what we want in a relationship. Either during or after differentiating, two people in a relationship might end up mostly talking about surface level things daily life activities, or task-oriented topics. This is called the circumscribing phase, and there's often less focus on improving the relationship, getting to know each other better, or speaking each other's love languages. When Robbie and Jen only see each other every few months while visiting their families, they start to notice that their catch-ups are like the ones they have with acquaintances. Like differentiating, circumscribing can be a natural result of a busy life chapter. Like parents with infants may only talk about diapers and feeding schedules because they're sleep deprived. So circumscribing isn't always an issue, but if it becomes a permanent shift, it can be a sign that each member of the couple is pulling away. This pulling away leads to stagnating, where the relationship is tense, awkward, and sometimes boring. Some people react to these feelings by trying desperately to connect with an unwilling or distant partner. Others react by pulling away and pretending like nothing is wrong, even as they have less and less in common. For example, Robbie starts to act grumpy towards Jen because she used to be so much more fun to talk to. Meanwhile, Jen tries to keep things breezy, ignoring the changes. Now, both people know that something is seriously wrong, but they either don't know how to fix it or don't feel like it should be fixed. This is called the avoiding stage. They ignore each other and may even deliberately do things separately as much as possible. Staying busy with separate activities allows each one to cope with the coming breakup. For Robbie and Jen, the years after college are marked by longer and longer stretches of time when they don't see each other. Any kind of breakup is really hard. And when a formal end to the relationship is announced, the terminating phase has arrived. This can go a number of ways. Romantic partners often take time to decide what their relationship will look like moving forward after this version ends. They might try to stay friends, co-parent children, or avoid contact in the future. With social media, Exes often choose to block, unfollow, or end contact with each other online. This is usually a healthy choice rather than keeping an eye on what their ex-partner is doing in the future. But with Robbie and Jen, they only recognize they went through the terminating stage in hindsight when someone asks, whatever happened with Robbie? And Jen waves it off saying, I haven't really talked to him since college. I think he lives in Nova Scotia now. The connection they once started on the school bus and built through monkey bar races is no more. 
at least for now. And that's okay. Now, we've talked about Robbie and Jen progressing through the coming together and coming apart stages in this order, but it's important to be aware that they can happen in any order, and some stages may be skipped entirely. For instance, some personality types wouldn't bother with stagnating or avoiding and would instead prefer to address things directly when they see the growing apart starting to happen. This kind of person might skip right to terminating. So it turns out that relationships are far more complex than the movie versions that start with the meet cutes. The more we learn about how relationships tend to go from frameworks like Knapp's relational development model, the more we can notice and consciously communicate about what's going on in a relationship. And that helps us to treat each other better. Thanks for watching Study Hall, Intro to Human Communication, which is part of the Study Hall Project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time.